Well, it's nine o'clock. Let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone to Vision 2020 of the uh, Illinois Farmland Values and Lease Trends Conference. And believe me, when we uh, brought that uh, theme, we never really thought it was going to be uh, is uh, an interesting a time as uh, what it is. But uh, it's being brought to you live here from the studios at Mumford Hall in the University of Illinois and live stream across the world during this historic period of time, one which we will not soon forget. And, and as uh, the movement across the United States and better parts of the world come to a standstill, we are here to reflect on the value of America's second greatest asset behind its citizens. And that is the land under which all good things are produced and the performance of this unique asset in this time of extreme volatility. I am David Klein, the chairman of the Illinois Society of Professional Farm Managers Land Values and Lease Trends Committee. This conference was not possible today without our very special relationship and extreme gratitude that we feel towards the University of Illinois College of ACES and their staff. Most importantly, Jim Baltz, uh, the instructional design specialist here, and uh, he is helping us conduct this webinar. Dr. Gary Schnicki and Dr. Bruce Sherrick, the professors here who have coordinated this effort. Our relationship with these individuals are those members of uh, the Realtors Land Institute and Illinois Society of Professional Farm Managers that make this day possible. Their data collection, insights, and opinions are crucial to providing the barometer to this imperfect farmland market, uh, one which, uh, quite honestly, I know many of us are thankful for right now since it's not necessarily traded on a daily basis as far as the physical asset itself. And uh, that way our, uh, our balance sheets and things of that nature maybe aren't being uh, uh, quite so destroyed in the process for the farming population. There will be a light at the end of this tunnel, and, and I think we are already starting to, to uh, see some of those things. Uh, in three weeks or so, planters will begin to roll, a crop will get planted, and hopefully something can start to seem normal once again. Thank you all for those of you who are listening and adjusting to uh, our schedule with this and tuning in this morning. We are adapting to the environment and appreciate your consideration and flowing along with us as we made the difficult decision to cancel the in-person conference uh, this past Monday. We will give special mention uh, this morning to our conference sponsors, Capital Ag Property Services, Farmers National Company, First Mid Ag Services, Heartland Ag Group, Hertz Farm Management, and Land Pro LLC for their efforts in helping get this conference going. Uh, we want to give uh, special thanks to the Doubletree, as we mentioned earlier, for their consideration in our canceling the meeting site. We do plan to have them hosting the conference again in 2021. If you want to mark your calendars for March 17th and 18th. Uh, too often we forget that uh, those folks are impacted by this as well. And not far, far behind them, I want to give special thanks to Carol Mary, our Executive Director, and Jill Bernal, the Executive Director of RLI, who have been working overtime uh, on this adjustment, and we can't thank them enough. Appraisers, everyone uh, who needs uh, continuing education must send Carol Mary their license number so he can submit their names to receive the credit. I think majority of you have been getting emails from uh, Carol uh, off and on all week. So you should have his email address in your inbox if you are an appraiser and need continuing ed credit. Uh, please send Carol to uh, an email to let him know that you need that by the end of the day, Monday, March 23rd. Our first speaker this morning will be Kevin Van Trump of the Van Trump Report. Uh, obviously, as we've discussed, Dr. Bruce Sherrick, uh, We'll follow after that, and then finally, uh, I will wrap up the conference with uh, Dr. Gary Schnicki regarding the actual uh, information from our surveys and data collection from 2019. As we begin, Kevin Van Trump. Kevin's a native of Missouri, uh, having grown up in a small rural farm community just outside Kansas City. He and his uh, wife were high school sweethearts, and they moved to Chicago in the early 1990s where he began a career in commodities. He is the president and founder of Farm Direction, a full service consulting firm, uh, which now includes his daily Van Trump report. Uh, this circulation uh, goes to approximately 35 countries around the world and includes top executive fund traders, money managers, and political leaders. Kevin is going to be helping us navigate the future of agriculture. Kevin, I'd like to turn it over to you. I appreciate that. Um, thanks everyone. I, I, I second all of the uh, thank yous I know in our hedge fund uh, community and uh, our investment world community, we circulate a lot of the U of I um, research and material, and we, we find it very, very helpful. And so we're, we're more uh, 
more appreciative uh, than a lot of folks probably uh, realize. And so, like I said, thank you guys again and for all you guys do up there. And thanks for you guys for uh, having us and, and Carol and, and the crew. So, um, you know, I had the slide deck prepared. I go out and uh, speak a lot of times to investment funds or large banking groups that, you know, dole out to he heavy, uh, heavy monies into the rural ag communities as far as land purchases and things like that for either pension fund type plays or, uh, or other, uh, some of the other big, big funds. So had this uh, prepared and then we catch this wild curveball, um, you know, a couple months back, I said about a month and a half back and uh, things start to change. And, uh, and all of a sudden here we are, you know, and then it is up on us. So I'm going to try and get through where our vision was, I think you guys made a great reference to it, where our vision was coming into this. And then at the end, we can discuss and talk about where we see things moving now uh, in this new world. I, I, there's definitely going to be some shakeout and fallout. And, um, you know, we're, it's going to be our job and we're going to have to try and figure out what's going to remain relevant uh, as we move to the other side of this thing. So there'll be a couple of slides in there that to me, you know, will be fitting for the situation. But like I said, and it, and it has a lot to do, and it'll just make you think a little bit, I hope. That's really what I'm trying to do is just challenge our thoughts and our perspectives. So um, let me get this thing moving right along so we can stay on track. Here we go. Sometimes, you know, the only reason for us to be somewhere else is, is to see things from a different perspective. And I tell a lot of people, you know, probably the only reason I'm at where I'm at uh, today is because of all the mistakes I've made. Uh, I've you know, had a ton of uh, investments go bad, more go bad than than right. A ton of different businesses we've invested in or, or things that we've done through the years on the investment side. And I've tried to learn from a lot of those things. And some of my biggest mistakes um, were really because of my perspective. And I was raised in a small rural town uh, just outside of Kansas City. And so sometimes as we move forward and I get older, and I kids laugh, my perspective probably even becomes a little bit more difficult for me to overcome. Um, I remember things being how they were back home on the farm and then in the rural communities. And, I, you know, I have a tough time sometimes writing the check or, or stroking a capital call check for the new stuff. You know, it's hard for me to understand people paying $10 uh, for a burrito or $8 for a coffee when I can't even pronounce the name of the coffee. So I, I think, you know, that you see what I'm saying as we start to get older and reference our past, sometimes our perspective gets skewed. And that skewed perspective is honestly, like I said, is what's gotten me in trouble a lot of times uh, with my investments. So I'm just going to try and open your minds to some things uh, and some data where we stand. I think we're all now really being woken up and, and enlightened to this millennials uh, movement as we're seeing the spread here of this virus. And, and things have dramatically changed. You know, this is our largest demographic, uh, the millennials, you're talking about age, you, you can 22, we'll call it 22, 23 years old to about 38, 39, right in that age frame. Um, about seven, I'd tell folks about seven day at 10 years ago, we'd go to some think tanks groups with you know, Soros, some of those guys, and they would say the millennials are almost as big as the boomers. And then it was the millennials are as big as the boomers. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I might not be the sharpest tool in the shed. I'm sitting there thinking, okay, well, the the boomers are dying off, so that makes sense. And a couple of years later, it was the millennials are bigger than the boomers ever were. And, um, you know, I, I, I kind of sat there for a minute and the guy next to me, at the, he's like, how's that possible? You know, because there's no babies being born between ages 22 and 38. And uh, as we sit here today right now, because of our immigration policies and the way things are, that demographic group continues to get larger and larger. So the people that are making the long journeys and treks, generally fall in that age group of 22 to 38 right here at this point in time. Um, that, that, you know, that, and you have to understand they have different views about life and different views and perspectives uh, than we have. So as they get bigger and bigger, um, you're going to see things change and it's, it's going to be hard for some of us to, to grasp and fully understand because we just don't have a reference point for that. So we, we, we just need to pay close attention. Uh, currently, the millennials are the largest uh, portion of the U.S. population, most common age today. I think that's up to about 23, 24 now. But by 2020, which is right now, one out of every um, uh, three Americans will be millennials. So 
you start to play this forward, the millennials make up 75% of the entire U.S. workforce. And why this really matters is what I kind of really want you to take home. Uh, like I said, the oldest millennial turns 38 this year. Unemployment for those, I mean, now this is a, this is a problem because unemployment was basically nothing for this group. Uh, it had gotten, uh, it had shrank down to, to a good area. And then we had started to see it start to tick a little higher as we had seen more college kids struggle to find some jobs. And now obviously we're going to fall off a cliff here for a minute uh, with this virus. But the takeaway on it is that spending tends to peak at about age 46 to, they say 46 to 50. Um, and then it continues to plateau to about 55 and then, then it begins to fall off aggressively. So, you know, I, I think you have to ask yourself constantly, who's taking money out of the stock market? And that's the boomers. And who's putting money into the stock market? And that's the millennials. And so when you see the, the, the Chipotle's, the Tesla's, the Starbucks, and, you know, these are our strengths in our market, um, you know, were the strengths in the market, the Facebooks, the Googles, um, you know, the, and you, you have to reference that. And I want you to really push yourself on, on trying to figure out what the boomers brought to us. The boomers, uh, one of the greatest generations uh, that our nation's ever seen and have brought many things and changed many industries from big box stores to, you know, uh, uh, fast food to, to everything that they had brought in. But they're now they're moving out and, and we got to see this millennial generation is, is going to be bigger than the boomers and, and what new changes are they going to bring in? And I think that's where we you know, it, may, it gets tough as we're older and maybe a more rural uh, background and perspective. It, it's hard sometimes to wrap our head around that. The other issue is this. The stock market tends to rip higher when we have a huge influx of workers between 35 and 49. And I just told you the millennials are about 38, 39 years old. They're just getting into their uh, earning years where they're going to start earning uh, more money. And, and as they earn more money and have kids and do things, they're, they're going to start uh, making some things happen. now. Obviously, uh, this was what happened when the boomers went through that period of, uh, like I just said on the last slide. So we're of the premise, and we've been of the premise. And I'm, <laughs> this is going to be a little different song and dance at the end here, but uh, you know we've been of the premise. We've been long this market for almost, like I said, over a decade. I started tapering some things back, you know, about a year ago, and uh, we kind of got more aggressive on the taper back around the Super Bowl when. We started catching all the the inside and news out of China. So, you know, will we have pullbacks? Certainly, but we believe the demographics are right right now for the next 10, 15 years. You're probably going to have some significant rips in the uh, stock market to the upside. Obviously, this is the uh, one off right now, right now, and we're going to have to see how this plays out. But but we're of the belief with the demographics, the way they're set up, you're going to have a lot of. Uh, millennials start to make a lot of money. And uh, I think we're just, you're just going to have to be right on what they like, you know, and that's what's really changing. And that's, it's really what's changing in the farm communities as well. We're, we're, you know, we used to grow whatever we wanted to grow and the consumer got to pick from it. Now uh, the consumer is going to tell us what to grow, it seems like, or what we need to grow. And, uh, and, and those are the things we're going to have to adjust to as we move forward. So let me get through this slide here a little bit and you guys have access to it. So you know, the new average age uh, marriage, these are things that you folks know. I mean, this is ticked dramatically higher. My wife and I got married when we were, she was 21, I was 23. And you know, we've been married a long, long time, 30 plus years here. And it's, uh, you know, we like we said, we're high school sweethearts. But when we first went to Chicago, I remember people would ask my wife and say, you know, oh, you, you guys OK? And, and we were like, yeah, we, you know, what do you mean? And they're like, well, you're married awful young. Did you guys have kids in uh, high school? And we're like, no. <laughs> No, that's just what we do back home. We kind of get married young. So, you know, I, I think that this, a lot of people aren't uh, used to some of that. And then we're starting to see this number work its way aggressively higher. So just it tells you that they're going to be a little slower to buy new homes. You know, uh, the, the probably a new home surge coming. Uh, it's, it's not really here as of yet. We think it's still lagged to some degree. Um, you're going to see, you know, they're a little late to buy the second minivan and things of that nature because they're a little later to get married. So, so we believe it's going to push some things back a little bit and you're going to have an economic boom that's probably uh, still a few years away. So um, here's one that I think is, is tough for people to swallow, uh, at least in our, uh, in our part of the country. Uh, 
you know, the, the millennials and, and the biggest generation uh, in our history is most concerned about social unrest. And it, it makes sense. I mean, they see there's a big dividing line between, you know, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, gun rights, uh, abortion. I mean, there's just, uh, there's just been some, I have spoke on this uh, at several occasions. Yeah. In today's world with social media and everything else, it seems people are, you know, we're not defined by the, the common threads that bring us together as a nation. Everyone wants to be defined by what they're against. And it's sad that, uh, we've moved to that state, but you know, it, it is where it is. And they believe that a bigger government will help curtail social unrest. So, you know, even though a lot of us want to believe certain ways, just remember, as you sit here, that portion of that uh, uh, section of the demographics is getting bigger and bigger, and we seem to be getting smaller and smaller. So it's definitely creates a unique setup. Um, you know, this is the most ethically diverse uh, generation that we've ever had. That's something else to remind yourself. When I go out and speak, I, I'm sorry, I speak for boards, um, banks, anybody in the rural and the energy sectors and the trading sectors. And it's predominantly, the room is predominantly, I, I would say 95% white men, uh, about my age, a little older, and, and that's the room. And so we all could go out and hunt and fish and maybe go out and have a drink and go to a sporting game. And we, we'd all have a lot in common. We all do. Uh, but Interestingly, that gets us in trouble a lot of times with our investments because the rest of the world, and especially here in the United States, it's changing dramatically from a demographic reason. Like I said, first time ever, you have 50% of all U.S. babies born in the U.S. are non-white. U.S. schools, 2014-15 um, kind of rolled over. By 2043, the majority of the U.S. population will be non-white. Like I said, I played sports my whole life, played through college. I, I, I have no racial divide any way, shape, or form other than the fact, uh, like I said, I think it definitely skews uh, our mindset and our perspective at times because we think things are going to be a certain way and they're not. And and people, uh, you know, a different ethnicities uh, like, may like things differently. And and like I said, I, that's we got to be open-minded to that as, as we move forward. Um, here you guys go. So my daughter... I don't know if you guys, some of you guys follow the report, some, some may not, but my daughter just got out of quarantine. She was in Italy uh, finishing her architect degree. So she had to, uh, it's a requirement. She goes to the University of Arkansas. And they have to spend one full semester in Italy uh, with their program in Italy. So she was over there and yeah, the wife and I were definitely uh, on pins and needles. The U.S. Embassy got her out, uh, looks like just in time, so to speak, uh, but she had to be in quarantine for two weeks and she got out, but to make a, we can talk about that later at the, at the end, but um, she gets a call from, to go out to California. They wanted her to do an internship out in California. And she told us, you know, Hey, this big company wants me to come to California. And she loves the lifestyle out there. You know, I, I look at my wife and I'm like, Oh hell, here's where all the craziness is about to start. And we just kind of chuckled. And, but you know, when you go to California, it, it's a, to me from the Midwest, it's, it's so it's, it's massively, uh, different. I mean, um, I was in a meeting to write a check for a company and uh, I just couldn't get my mind around the whole idea of the concept. And I had said to him, I, I don't, I don't think I want to do the deal. And the, the, a lot of younger kids, not a lot. There was a handful of younger kids in the group. I call them kids. They were probably 35 or something. And they said, Oh, come on, pops. You, uh, you know, you got to, you got to quit being this way. You, you know, this is going to fly. This is going to work. And, and they said, do you understand one out of eight Americans live in the state of California? I said, there's no way. And they said, wiki it on your phone. You know, they hit me with the wiki. And I said, you, you look it up. I mean, one in eight Americans basically live in the state of California. You start to factor in uh, Oregon and up into Seattle or through Portland and into Seattle. I mean, you definitely have a, uh, a different uh, perspective uh, out there. You start to get over that onto the East coast and you know, and factor in those numbers. And, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a different perspective than when I go to speak for my, with our friends and uh, business partners up through the Dakotas and, you know, and into Minnesota and Iowa and Illinois and Nebraska, it's just, it's different. So it, it's massively different, but the demographics, like I said, the shift in the population is there to support some of the craziness. Now this one I've had for a while, I was, uh, I had to make a capital call on a company that we had invested in. Their main source of revenue was napkins. I'm sitting in a meeting, younger kid sitting next to me. He says, Hey, you ain't going to get that money back. And I, I just kind of chuckled and laughed. And 
I said, why do you say that? And he's like, nobody buys napkins anymore. I said, yo, you're nuts. I'm like, my wife buys napkins. I said, my grandma bought napkins. My mom bought, I mean, we had napkins for special napkins for Easter. We had napkins for Christmas. We had napkins, you know, we, we were loaded up on napkins through, <laughs> through the years as a kid in uh, rural America, it seemed like. So I, I said, dear nuts, I get on the phone, I call uh, my son, Jordan. He was down at University of Arkansas at the time. And I said, hey, son, you've been to the grocery store this last couple weeks, like, yeah. And I said, you buy napkins? He pauses. He says, Dad, why are you always calling me with these weird questions? He, he says, no, I didn't buy any napkins. And I said, well, I, I can't get my hand right. I said, have you bought napkins down there? And he's like, no, I, I don't, don't buy napkins. I said, what do you guys buy? And he says, paper towels. I said, interesting. So I pick up the phone. I call Kenny. That's my daughter. Her name's Kennedy, but I call her Kenny. I said, hey, babe, did you go to the store? And she's kind of a wild child. And she says, Dad, I haven't been to the store in probably three or four weeks. And I said, well, of course you have it. And she said, I said, did you buy any napkins last time you're there? And she says, no, Dad, I don't, I don't buy napkins there. And I said, how about any of your girlfriends or any of the girls in the sororities? And she's like, no one. I've never seen napkins. She's like, she said, that's an old person thing like you and mom. And I said, okay, perfect. And, and so, you know, you start to think of things. I think napkins are probably a, a, a dying entity here, so to speak. But you look at other things. They closed the Harley plant here in the uh, here in Kansas City, laid off uh, several hundreds. Um, I was speaking on two different occasions. I spoke right behind or in front of the Harley CEO maybe 10 years, eight years ago. And we went out a few different times. And he, he knew at that point, he said, we're, we're going to have a really difficult time selling motorcycles to millennials. And I said, How, why? Why do you see that? And he says, you know, I... Well, to be honest, I mean, his honest answer, I said, yeah, give me the honest answer. And then he said, because your generation raised a bunch of candy asses. And I, I, we, I we chuckled and laughed. And I said, my dear, my kid has a motorcycle. He got a dirt bike. He's got Harley. I got Harley. All my friends have bikes. He says, yeah, not necessarily through the Midwest, but he says, you know, the helicopter parenting and the I tried trophies and, you know, the, the, you got to if you look at demographics, they say the baby boomers were the biggest risk takers in our nation's history. Hitchhike across the country, leave home 14, 15, check back in. Millennials are the least risk adverse. They're, they're not real fond of risk, but they are the closest with their families. That's, that's kind of an interesting mix. Um, they're not, they don't take big risk. They're real close with their families. That was one of our reasons that we invested heavily in Facebook off the IPO because we thought demographically it's going to be the one tool that keeps the millennials tied to their parents and grandparents, which we still see that being the play. Now, you know, how Facebook gets their data and things uh, managed and, and things of that nature might be a, a one-off, but the, it's definitely, and, that, and that's a scare right now with the coronavirus. Uh, we, you've never had a, a, a generation of this size still at home with parents and grandparents. So that's a, that's a big worry. And, and, it, and it is a worry as we move forward. Uh, so, so we're just kind of showing you here. They don't like big box stores. My wife and I and uh, some of my friends were on a conference call the other day, and we we're trying to figure out what's going to shake out here. What, what's in every major economic downturn? You have what we call a shakeout, and when you drop, basically, we're going to drop below water. We're going to see who can hold their breath the longest, and then when we pop back up on the other side to get air, some people aren't going to come back up as far as businesses. So, you know, the millennials are already basically have tried have killed off these uh, these bigger department stores. Uh, they've killed off some other things. We suspect possibly the movie theaters are probably gone. Uh, my wife and I are kind of disappointed because we'd love to go to the movies, but you know we lost the drive-in theaters on, on the uh, last blowout to the downside. Uh, we did some major disruption also to rural America uh, uh, in, the, in the small rural towns and communities on that last downstroke as well. Um, we, we are kind of thinking the movie theaters probably are going to go to the wayside. Uh, Disney's going to start releasing. I saw a few of their things early. Uh, Netflix looks like they're going to release early. We also heard yesterday that some of the movies that were supposed to roll out in the coming weeks, they're not going to release at the movie theaters because the movie theaters are not existent and they're going to shoot them and we can buy them straight off of our, uh, off our computer for like nine ninety nine or nineteen ninety nine. So uh, I think it's going to change some things. So I just need, need folks to, to really be thinking you know, what do the millennials already kind of have on their heels? And uh, this probably tips that over the top uh, to some degree. And that's going to change some dynamics for a lot of folks in the investing world. So be careful hanging on to your old thoughts that it just look, 
we, look at what happened GM stock. Look what's happened to Ford stock. Look at GE stock. Look at all the big leaders that, that the boomers ha, ha, had created and, and made millions and millions in as stocks. I mean, they're, they're being liquidated by the masses. So I, you just have to try and release some of that. It, just things are not going to continue uh, on, the, on, the, on the path that we may have thought at one time. Cereal, this one kind of hits us hard. You know, I mean, we're here in the ag space and, you know, uh, we talked to a lot of folks at General Mills and some of the other places. And I asked my daughter, I said, you, she used to eat cereal here at home some, and she doesn't eat much cereal. And I said, babies, the kids at school eat cereal? She's like, no, not at all, really, Dad, minimal. And I said, why do you guys not eat cereal? She's like, that's too inconvenient. And you guys, I'm sure, grew up. My grandma always made breakfast for us every morning before we went out and worked. And then my mom made breakfast for us. And then my wife makes breakfast for us. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's something we, 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 I guess, don't have perspective of. My daughter, I watched her. And I just pay attention to what she does. I've seen her take some cereal when she's running behind her. We didn't have some. Maybe mom went, uh, was out and didn't cook breakfast for her. She got up late was probably what happened. So I've seen her pour cereal in the Casey's cup and then pour milk in the Casey's cup and jump in her Jeep and take it with her. And that's how she has her cereal now. So, I mean, it's crazy. Uh, they say it's just more convenient to get a health bar, GNC, you know, some type of shake uh, or go to Starbucks and grab uh, something healthy uh, at Starbucks. So I don't know. I mean, it's interesting. It, it, you know, like I said, th things change. Uh, times, times are definitely different. They hate the big banks. Uh, the millennials hate the big banks. Uh, you know, I, I suspect and what we get back all of our data is during the 08 to 09 debacle, there were some fairly choice words probably around the dinner table uh, as the house was getting foreclosed on. And I, you know, I think that hurt the banks longer term. So our investments, when we make investments uh, in the financial sector, we, we have made, uh, we have made some purchases here uh, of Goldman Sachs. Uh, and I did buy, Really, Goldman Sachs. I did buy a little bit of Square just yesterday, and I bought a little bit of uh, PayPal. Now, we like PayPal because they own Venmo. You know, Square, we think Square is probably going to continue to take it on the chin a little bit just because there's not a lot of gatherings happening right now at the moment. We like Goldman Sachs uh, in the way they've turned and pivoted, uh, and we like the fact that they've teamed with Apple on some of their new financing and some of their Apple cards. I, I think Goldman will probably hang in there. You know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, uh, right now you got mass liquidation on everything, so it's, it's a, uh, you know, this is a, this is a tough time to forecast that. But anyway, we like to to shift and look more toward the fintech side of things. Uh, we think the traditional big banks will probably struggle, just like you have seen some of the traditional uh, bigger companies we named earlier uh, that have been struggling from from the past. So it, it'll be interesting to see how they play this out. If the big banks lose face again with the American public, uh, and 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 get into positions where they're going to repo houses and do some things on that nature because of this fallout, they're going to really take it on the chin. So I suspect they've got a big headwind ahead of them right here. So, um, you know, and a lot of this, this brings up the crypto, uh, cryptocurrency situation and really cryptocurrencies and the whole platform uh, was created after that 08 or during that 08, 09 crisis. So things, things become created and then, uh, things shift and things change. It's just, uh, take for example, Uber. We were pretty heavily invested on Uber off that first break, not not this recent break, but the first break after the IPO, made some good money in it. Started to build a pretty big position because I just love all the data that uh, that Uber has. You know, our kids, I mean, they did everyone, they know, Uber knows where you're at, where you're this, where that. Um, I liquidated quite a bit of Uber this last week. I just worry, that if we hunker down here for a while, uh, we may we may pop back up, you know, 18 months, 24 months later, you may have uh, Tesla and you may have Waymo and, and some of the other folks that really have uh, fine tuned this driverless vehicle uh, deal. And, and there will be no need for Ubers if, if they just send 10,000, 20,000 driverless vehicles onto Kansas City or, or into Illinois and different locations where they just circulate uh, all day long. And you'll, you'll that that uh, may not pop back up. So I, we're a little hesitant there. I do like the data play. I mean, maybe we get down here and continue to get cheaper and cheaper. I may, you know, I think we were at 14 bucks yesterday in Uber. And, you know, you get it down in single digits, it might be worth looking at. But, the, you know, what assets outside the data are they really uh, got their hands on? So, we find it interesting. Um, the Bitcoin craze, like I said, we we were not 
the earliest of adopters to Bitcoin. We were talking about it fairly early. I did make a decent, uh, had a good run in it. Uh, we exited some. I kept a handful. Uh, I still have some Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I don't really, ha I have some Bitcoin cash off the fork that happened uh, early and I've liquidated uh, and don't really currently own much of anything else in the crypto space. I just kept the Bitcoins, uh, just to see what happens and see how it plays out. But it was real money being made. Like I said, $100 invested, uh, you know, back in, in, in 2010 would have been worth about $10 million. I'd be worth more like about $7 million today since we broke it down. I think we're around 5800 in Bitcoin somewhere in there this morning. Um, it's been all over the place. You know, we, we see it as a possibility. I, I don't know if it's the one or, or which currency becomes one. We believe there will be. Uh, a crypto type currency uh, that that becomes the leader. I'm sure the U.S. is going to have to have its say in which one that is, and that's why I'm, I'm a little hesitant to to say it's Bitcoin. I, I don't know. Um, we, we will see as we move forward. But the oh, the the reason we bring it up is because of the technology that uh, the the cryptos are built on, which is the blockchain technology, and the blockchain technology is just simply an underlying ledger. You know, I that, that does checks and balances and and it's it's really high speed. We like to say say to people, especially in this space, if someone were to come to me now and ask me to invest in a traditional title company, you know, I probably wouldn't do it. I, I think a title company is going to have to be smart, and they're probably going to have to become pretty technologically savvy because everything we hear, and we're starting to see a little bit with Redfin and some of the other places uh, in the real estate side, you know, you're you're probably I guess at least I know our kids will. They'll, they'll close instantaneously on their phone on a land purchase. Um, it'll be on block. You'll tie the title companies won't exist in that capacity that they currently exist. And they they will certainly probably find a place to pivot. Uh, but you'll close instantaneously on block. Uh, all the title docs and clean titles will will be done through the counties and in the states, and, and and it'll be placed through the blockchain, and there'll be proper checks and balances in place. And, and like I said, you won't. Like when you go in now and sign stacks and stacks of papers, that probably won't happen. You probably do a fingerprint uh, or some type of eye scan and uh, and you close and uh, and it'll be that simple. So, you know, this is something we're keeping a close eye on because we believe blockchain is going to massively impact the farm. A couple of my friends and partners and Soren Schroeder was the CEO of Bungie. He was one of my good friends and uh, we're partners on some land deals and I have a couple other friends. Uh, Bill Kruger that was over at Anderson's. We're partners on a couple of deals and um, it's some, some different folks uh, that are higher up. Some of the guys at uh, ADM and some of the guys at Cargill that I talk to regularly that are, that are, uh, you know, on, on the leadership team. We, um, you know, they, they, they would, they probably lean into and want to have the farm blockchain somewhere within the next, like I said, 24, 36 months. And, you know, I, I think the blockchain's probably uh, going to be good, I think, for agriculture and going to be good for the farm. I, I, I think if you try and fight it and fight the headwinds, it's it's going to probably uh, just not be a good case. We, what we hear and how they play, play it out is they think the ag retailer, it's going to start from there with the block. They're going to blockchain, they're going to know what you buy, and they're going to know what you have. Uh, and, and, you know, I suspect if you spray dicamba, you're going to get dinged. You know, you're going to go in and there's going to be a penalty on it. If you put good things on your crop, there's going to be a premium paid. Um, what we're seeing happen is, is it's just simple. It's like Patagonia. They want a certain type of cotton with a certain uh, name. Uh, our friend Galen Lawrence, he's the largest landowner in the United States, uh, row crop owner. Let's put it that way. Sorry about that. He owns, uh, Galen, I think, owns 180,000 acres uh, row crop through here. And then he owns, sorry, uh, then he owns a, uh, a lot of citrus ground uh, down through Florida and those other areas. So uh, we went toured Galen's new uh, cotton gin, his cotton mill uh, down outside Wilson not that long ago. But it was interesting for him to tell you that they need a tag on all the cotton that they sell. And the tag, let's say it's going to Patagonia, let's say it's going to uh, the concerts out of Coachella, the concerts at Austin City Limits, uh, you know, wherever these millennials and these kids want to buy all these T-shirts. Said so most of those manufacturers and makers of those T-shirts for millennials, they want a story on the cotton, and they want to be able to tell that story, just like Chipotle tells a story. We don't. I'm not saying we agree with any of this, 
but I'm letting you know these millennials like to buy a story and um, they want to hear that their cotton was grown on a farm with, you know, trying to do good for, for the world and trying to, uh, to, to make things better. We saw Cargill uh, a year and a half, two years ago, I guess at the, uh, at Thanksgiving, they rolled out the honeysuckle white. And what you did is you simply went up to the turkey and you put your phone on the barcode and up popped this. And, uh, you know, it's your, your own little Tom Turkey. He was raised by, uh, you know, Aunt Mary and, and, and Uncle Uncle Sam out there at the at the farm. And <laughs> he had a great little turkey life. He ran around in the front yard and he had some nice organic corn and he played with a dog named Rex. And he, he just had a great old time out there. And truck driver came up and hauled him off, listened to the little uh, George Strait. So, hey, the kids like it. And, and that's what they and they'll pay for it. And, and you know, and, and we believe that uh the ABCs and them, they're going to be able to, to get a premium. So they're going to go direct. They're going to try and make relationships with the Whole Foods and the different players in the space. And they're going to try and gain a premium. And they're going to ask the growers to have that top, that tag. All it is would be like a tag, like I said, um, that underlying blockchain tag that travels with your crop. Uh, and we think that's probably going to play out here moving forward. Uh, you know, that blockchain is going to be an important ingredient in, in gaining some premiums. And we believe we're going to need premiums uh, to make this thing work moving forward. Uh, if you can see here, let's not talk about that screen yet. If you look at the bottom right, uh, it's a single cow burger. That's being pushed by Amazon. My son was at school uh, two years ago. He called me and said, hey, Dad, you know when uh, we come home or when, when you said the football guy's over and Kennedy would have dancing where and you and Mom cook burgers and anything, you know where those which cow that burger came from exactly? I said, so why do you call me with these stupid questions? I, I just reversed it. I said, no, we don't know which cow, you know, you don't know which cow exactly. And he says, well, Amazon keeps sending us this, this propaganda, I call it, to uh, say that we need to know where our burgers are coming from. And, you know, the burger should come from a single cow that's traceable back to that cow. And I said, yeah, that's, that's interesting. And, and, and I suspect they are pushing that because they have the answer right there in the bottom right you know, single cow burger. So when they have all the data and they know my kids don't buy napkins and they know, uh, and they can force my kids in, into thinking that they need a single cow burger, I'm letting you know, this is where this is going and this is where this is headed. So I, I, I find it hard to believe that we're going to be able to fight this situation uh, real well. This hangs on my wall in my office here. It's how did you go bankrupt? Two ways, gradually, then suddenly. Ernest Hemingway. You know, pretty interesting. I use it a lot in life for, for different things, you know, just like the current situation. How, how did we get here? Gradually, then suddenly it felt like uh, with this current corona. I, you know, I, I mean, we'd seen it creeping around and, and doing some things. And now here we are all of a sudden. I, I talked to many of my farmer friends uh, in the last three or four years. You know, hey, you want to buy a boat? You want to buy a lake house? I said, no, I really don't. And uh, I, I have those. And I said, no. And I said, what the hell happened? They said, I don't know. I don't know. Just happened all at once. The bank didn't renew our line. You know, that, that's, that's probably not the case. I mean, it, it had been building and building, and it's happened gradually. And it's, it's, you just don't see it happening. You don't see change happen, you know, but, it, but it's happening. And what we found is mostly it's the folks that really are not really on board with technology. Now, here's where it's going to get important to pay attention, I think, is this was tough. Uh, for my folks and, and some folks that I knew to understand, technology is relentlessly deflationary. Understand it, it, it makes things cheaper. If you look at TVs right now, I mean, you can go out and buy a 65 inch TV. I think my son had one delivered to his front door for $450. I mean, the price is getting cheaper. So when I go out and talk to farm communities, if they're sitting there with the, the belief, and I always tell everyone, the most important thing as an investor or trader, you have to know what race you're putting your dog in. And a lot of people, don't they 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 don't see it the right uh, they they're not viewing it from the right perspective my opinion and, and several people that i know that are fairly uh, intelligent on the investing side and we we have farms and partners and farms to the united states and in south america we believe that we have our dog in a race for higher yields and lower prices make sure you clearly understand that higher yields lower prices you know, a lot of people are sitting here with the fallacy that we're going to go back and have $6 corn or we're going to have 
steadily $5 corn. You know, those, those are anomalies. Those are one off. Certainly those are going to have, those, those are going to happen at times where you have some weather hiccups or some things of that nature, but that's, that's, that's not going to happen uh, as a whole. Look what's happening in the energy sector. It might not be happening every day in front of your face, but it's a race to higher productivity of oil and lower prices. And eventually we're, we're probably going to start to, you know, even tapering back and, and tipping. I think they said this year, we're going to reach peak oil here in the U S in 2021. So I, you know, that's, that's probably as far as peak oil production, I should say. But what we have to keep in mind is, as this technology starts to finally make its way across uh, the ag sector, not only here in the United States, but abroad. Now, that's the issue. Abroad, it's going to be deflationary and it's going to create cheaper prices and more production. So we're going to have to pivot and we're going to have to move. And then I, I'll show you here in a couple of slides. I mean, you can talk computer power doubles about every 18 months. Some people say 24 months. Some may want to dispute it. Regardless, it is what it is. I believe God wires us to think linearly. We want to think out the rear view here. In the trading world, in the investing world, we always say, hell, you know, hindsight is 2020, obviously. Looking out the forward, uh, the front window is difficult. It's very difficult. We want to, it's easy to play this hand because we played the cards before. We, we, we've seen it. Um, here we sit uh, right at this point, and we believe we're, we're at a critical time uh, with technology where, where it's going to really start to move and shake to the upside. Uh, and you can get a handle on this by looking at numbers. I always tell people I got to just get a visual. 160 horsepower engine. Let's say a guy came to you back in 1980 and he said, hey, I think I can double this thing every 18 to 24 months. Uh, can you go ahead and, you know, show me how that would, that would play out? In 1980, it was 160 horsepower. By 1998, this is our tech bubble. You remember AOL, you got mail, the dial up. We're at 655 horsepower, 655,000. Look at the horsepower of the engine now. This is your doubling. Here we are in 2020. You know, I, I think you sit here and like what I'm trying to say is this: a lot of uh, uh, I, a lot of my friends and, and some of my older friends, we all they all sat at meetings and listened to every person talk about ag tech back in the 80s, 90s, do that. You know, hey, and nothing's really happening. And I'll tell you about three years ago, four years ago, you can really start. You could really start to see the difference in farms that were on board with technology and that weren't on board with technology. And what I'm trying to say is when these numbers at this level start to double, like they're doubling, it is going to make a big difference. And we've seen what's happened in the oil sector. The people that were on board with the frack and the horizontal, uh, they made it through it. They got the break evens down to a level that, uh, that was easily obtainable. Uh, those that weren't went out of business. Uh, so a lot of our friends in Oklahoma and Texas uh, went out of business. So, I think you're going to have to have uh, be on board with technology. You got to understand what race you got your dog in uh, for sure. And I think that's going to be important uh, as, as landowners uh, with your tenants and things of that nature. I think there's massive execution risk for businesses that are slow to adopt to technology. Um, I think that it's going to be critically important. Our biggest concern probably is the rapid advancement of technology and quickly it's spread across the globe. All of a sudden you look at the wheat market. I mean, we're the world's ancillary supplier of wheat. Here we go and shift into beans. Uh, you know, we, we continue to roll out more acres in South America ourselves at those farms and, and things. I, I think I'm of the same belief. Uh, Listen to Howard, ta Howard Buffett talk uh, a couple of different times. And, you know, I think Howard, Howard kept his land, but I think they stopped doing some farming just because there's a massive difference between being efficient and being competitive. And I think he hits it right on the head. Uh, you know, you take one more step to being more efficient, you could be broke. Uh, I, I think you got to be competitive. And it, so you ask yourself, how do I compete? I think someone's moving the uh, moving the dial here. Let me go back and see what we got. Um, you know, I, I think you have to go back and ask people, you know, how, how do you get more competitive uh, rather than a, efficient? And, and I think that's our big question. Um, number two, let, let's just put it this way. As you trade a commodity, in every commodity I've ever traded, whether it was corn, beans, uh, wheat, coffee, cocoa, sugar, cotton, it didn't matter what we were trading. Uh, if a market deems that it's oversupplied, right now, the market deems that corn's going to have 2.7 billion bushels, uh, 2.5, whatever, debate, whatever you want to debate. It believes we're oversupplied. So the market 
in a trading world has one job and one job only at that point in time. It's to seek out and find and rip the face off the highest cost producer. And, and that's the bottom line. That's the market's job. And make them hurt so much that they get out of the business. They have to get the acres out of the business. You got to get the supply out. So never before, at least in my time, and I, I studied a lot of history through the markets, has the world looked to the United States to be a high cost producer and trim acres. So when you have number two yellow corn, that's the same here in Illinois and Iowa and in Nebraska, that's the same as in parts of Argentina, parts of Ukraine and parts of Brazil, and we're trying to compete to sell it. Now, the market says, who's the high cost producer? And it's looking here. It's looking here in the United States and it's trying to find out who's sitting there with break evens at 425, 440, and you're out. And it's, and, and it's going to try to reduce acres. And, and you have to ask that question. Well, you know, I, I believe I'm of the contention. Some folks are going to have to pivot. I think folks that uh, have a good balance sheet, that own a lot of their ground, that have their uh, equipment costs under control, work on some of their own equipment, maybe have some equipment that is older that you can still work on. Uh, you know, you're going to have no problem drunk, growing traditional number two yellow corn, traditional beans, competing in a commoditized market. You shouldn't have any problem. You can be low cost provider and win the and win the market share. Uh, those guys that are going to be paying pretty high rents, uh, they've got uh, you know bigger loans. If interest starts to tick higher, you got you're buying new equipment all the time. You know you're gonna you're gonna find it really tough to compete against your neighbor that owns his ground outright uh, and those types of things. So maybe rather than being uh, growing traditional number two yellow corn, you have to diversify a little bit and you have to start to pivot and you have to start to think of things. What are the millennials going to want? What is ADM, Cargill, Bungie? What are they going to pay a premium for to get? And can, can I put a tag, a blockchain tag on it that uh, I'm using the, using uh, different inputs that are giving me a really high premium on the block? So th those are things that we think about as we move forward. And, and some of our ground, we can compete as low cost providers. Some ground, we can't compete. And it's just what it is. So we take a careful look at that. I do think it's interesting that we're seeing, we're seeing some things happen with land that we had no idea that we didn't know would happen. We got a call from Ohio uh, about a year and a half ago. It wasn't even a year and a half ago. Said, hey, Kev, we ain't got that much corn to sell this year. Move. And, you know, it, I, I can't believe what happened. I said, what are you talking about? I said, oh, they talked to one of my assistants on the phone. He said, we had leased our ground for 1200 bucks an acre. And I said, you got that number wrong with my assistant. I said, call him back. He said, like 120 an acre. Because the ground up there was going for about 180 an acre. Come back. He said, no, 1,200 an acre. And I said, what do you, what did he lease them? Five acres or, you know, what, what was the deal? He leased them over just over a thousand acres on a 20 year term for 1,200 bucks an acre. Two days later, same, I get another call from a similar area up in Ohio. Same deal. Okay. About two weeks after that, I'm down in the Boot Hill, Missouri, talking to a group of people. Kid comes up to me and says, hey, we'd like to have you help us out with some things. We got a piece of ground, 800 acres. That's our worst piece of ground, but these people want to offer us 900 bucks an acre rent. And I said, it's not possible. He says, no, I'm serious. We did the math and looked with, over the contract. Not the same company, but a different company. And it, it was right. This last, just this last winter, I went up and spoke for Compere all up through Minnesota and up through the Dakotas on a three-week deal. And uh, I had two different ladies come up to me and say they had signed similar deals, uh, one for about 950 and one for just over a thousand. Now that company wouldn't take anything under 800 acre uh, increments. Um, there were two other uh, people that I met with up there that were in talks at that point in time with Verizon. They had just initiated their talks on their ground. It was traditional corn and bean ground uh, with Verizon on a 5G, some type of 5G plot plan uh, that was going to take up a couple of thousand acres. So I don't know. Something changed in the solar. Something changed with the cell. There's, it, it has a lot to do with proximity to the sun, proximity to the grid. I will say this, my tip, what I've tried to do, most of the deals I've seen come down in the last year were close to a power plant. You know, in a lot of the communities where the power plants went in, everybody bitched and didn't want the ground around the power plant. I'm telling you, if you got the ground around the power plant, I think 
you you maybe have something and you might be able to buy it cheap at this point. Um, these they're piggybacking these solar grids off those power plants. And it's, I find that interesting. I think it's something to pay attention to. So you got to start thinking how, how could this land maybe be used uh, differently as we move forward uh, uh, with the grid? Uh, same type of play here. I, I believe, uh, let me get to it here real quick. Um, well, I'll just walk through it. I, you know, as far as we're, we're concerned, we think you're going to see this move and shift, uh, to electric to some capacity. I had sold one of my ethanol plants down in Loveland, Texas, uh, about a year ago. I exited a good uh, portion, uh, a good price, I should say. And uh, I caught a lot of hell from the ethanol industry. And I'm a huge ethanol fan and proponent, and I, and I love everything that ethanol does for us. And I'm still invested in some ethanol. Uh, probably right now, wish I wasn't. But the point is this. If you look on here, this is horses and carriages in 1990. You, you move forward. Uh, and there's a circle right there. There's one one thing that looks like an automobile. This is the same street, uh, 1913. Uh, if you look, there are still two holdouts. Uh, they got the carriage uh, and the buggy rolling. So uh, that was a complete infrastructure change. I mean, you went uh, having to work on cars and filling stations, gas stations to tires and roads. And that was a complete infrastructure change. The, the shift from a regular combustion engine to a uh, electric engine is minimal. Uh, it's not that big of a deal uh, from a logistics or I should say an infrastructure standpoint. One of our largest holdings was Tesla. Obviously, buyers at the high, we did liquidate some up at the higher range when we started to peak 700 and up. And I did buy a little bit of Tesla yesterday on the break. Um, we just think it's, it, it's not really about the cars or not. It's not a car play. It's, it's the data. It's the platform. Uh, you know, it, it's that type of play. Um, you know, I, I think you're just going to have to, there's many things they can do with it. Here's Tesla's, you know, feature we always tell people about. They were in uh, Chicago, Kimball. That's his brother, Lon's brother's Kimball. He owns a lot of agricultural stuff and a lot of uh, things in the restaurant space. Two years ago or a year and a half ago, he was at Gibson's downtown. We were down there. He gets out of his the car and just leaves the car and walks away from it. And everyone's like, what are you doing, dude? And he, he says, oh, the car will figure it out. It'll park itself. And we're like, there's no way. I mean, we're in downtown Chicago. I and mean, you got pay everywhere. He's like, well, if it can't find a free spot, it, it'll just keep on going. And we went into Gibson's and they, they were in there. We were a couple of hours. Comes out. He hits a button on his remote. Car comes back like triggered the horse. So, you know, we, we don't know. We had, we'd been on a conference call. Uh, this isn't anything. It's not public. We were on a conference call at one point, uh, maybe three months ago. They said they can retrofit the, the test, you know, because they just upload the, the stuff from the place and change the car all around all at once. Uh, they, they're going to retro them supposedly in 2020. Now, this probably set them back. It's probably more 2021 where you drive your car to work. Then you would hit an Uber or a Lyft button type feature and your car would just go out and make money for you all day long. It would Uber and Lyft for you and then come back, pick you up, take you home. So interesting plays. We think there's a million ways they can capitalize and make money, but that's a different story for a different time. Um, we're seeing it already happen in the villages out in California. They're bringing in another 500 uh, out in the villages out in Florida. You're going to have, uh, you know, you know, a lot of, uh, we, we laugh about it. We think we'll have a lot of drunk senior citizens rolling around in driverless uh, vehicles down at the villages. You just get in with your phone. You hold up your Google Maps. The phone, the car reads where you want to go, and it takes you there. They tack it onto your HOAs and things of that nature. So it's pretty funny uh, to think about. But let's let's see what we got here. You know, we've seen these. We've seen the birds. We've seen the, how, how they've changed some things. This is one to think about as a landowner. We believe the Hyperloop's going to happen. Like I said, things are on the, on the edge right now. but. Basically, that would have taken people from Kansas City to Chicago in about an hour. Shoots you through a tube at about 750 miles an hour. Um, I told my wife, I hope they have some big tubes. I don't want to get stuck in any hairpin turns in there. So we kind of laugh. But we suspect in, in our space, we had sat in a meeting where they said, hey, instead of shooting humans through a tube at 750 miles an hour, why don't we shoot some grain through a tube uh, or some type of, uh, you know, uh, basically corn or wheat. It makes a lot of sense. It, it would it would just change the dynamics immensely if you were to run a hyperloop uh, from the Dakotas out to the PNW or, or maybe other areas that maybe corn deficient uh, or grain deficient. It would change the, the inner dynamics a ton. The other thing I was just saying as landowners, 
I'm looking if they, when I catch wind that they're they're gonna move forward, uh, and I know some places where they are moving, they're going to move forward. Try to. Uh, I, I think you're gonna. I think we got a chance to buy that ground kind of cheap when it initially says it's going in because I think the people around there are gonna bitch and complain, and I think they're gonna drive. That's gonna drive down to the price. I think that's probably the buy because if you look back, you know, you all, it was always. Uh, a good play to uh, early on to buy the the ground around the rail and uh, when rail went in through the U.S. and 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 now we're seeing around these uh, power plants might be a good play. I like I said I don't know what terminals and what kind of things could come off of hyperloop situations. I like I said I I, I would be probably a buyer on the break. Just maybe some people might not like it or want it, and I think maybe I, I might entertain that idea at least uh, as we move forward. So something to think about. Let's see where we're at here. I like this quote, irrelevance happens when the speed of change outside an organization is greater than the speed of change inside an organization. I heard Mary Barra talk about it. Uh, she was CEO of GM, and she said it's really what's buckled her down. Um, you know, and it's tough. It's just going to be a tough dynamic moving forward. So we're going to have to keep that in mind. The biggies for agricultural game changers that we see, you know, how are you going to farm in a, in a climate change environment? We, we believe that we're going to continue to press uh, this issue as the millennials continue to gain more votes. Uh, we're we're going to have to figure it out. Um, you know, what about lab grown meats? Uh, it, it's going to be for real. I mean, it's it's going to happen. I, I, I can't imagine in, in a million years I'd be sitting here saying that that's going to happen. I, and when it first came out, I'm like, there's no way this is a joke or something. I mean, we tried it. I hated it. It was. Yeah. But as I watch all this money pour into Wall Street from these millennials and continue to pour into Wall Street. And I listen and I'm on conference calls with Beyond Meat CEO and everyone else. And he's sitting on there like, I had no idea we'd get all this money. And oh my gosh, I can't believe Wall Street just gives us, keeps giving us all this money. Well, they're just getting better and better. Right now, the cost of fake meat is up here and the cost of traditional cattle is down here. But as we get more pressure for climate change, our costs are going to go up a little bit uh, to raise cattle and water and different things their cost is going to start coming down because they're going to get better and better and they're going to add more people and more technology and they're going to get better at what they do. Eventually, similar to uh, electric engine with Tesla. Eventually, you know, the electric engine gets cheaper than combustion engine. People say, how did it happen? Gradually than all at once. I mean, it, it's going to happen. Uh, I think we're still huge uh, exporters. Uh, I think we'll, we'll lead the space. I'm not saying that people are going to reduce their protein demand. I think protein demand is going to go up actually, but I, I think things are going to shift and change on who we sell to and, and the dynamics of that. So we need to pay attention to that as we move forward. Uh, clean energy, like I said, it's going to be a big, big ticket moving forward. I just kind of threw these in. Uh, I spoke at a, for, for a company out West. This was, they had this massive picture on the wall. This was a threshing machine uh, that his grandfather had had. And, and you can see the number of horses and, you know, 20 to 40 horses, you had a crew of 10, 10 guys, uh, sometimes five, 10 guys. And you, you, you'd get maybe, like I said, 10 to 20 acres a day done at best if the wheel didn't fall off the wagon, so to speak. And, uh, and, and you know, and we slowly started to move forward. Uh, this is Holt's uh, machine, uh, which became Caterpillar. Uh, and, and this started to make a little progress. And we started to see something more like a traditional combine. Early 1900s, really about by 1930s, we started to get into that more traditional tractor. Uh, situation but even look there i mean you know we, we don't see change but when we look back we're like holy smokes man we really made some uh, big leaps here and some big changes uh massey hits with uh what was the first self-contained kind of like combine here here into the 30s and 40s and then you really get john deere who uh took the implement and, and can the, the corn head and we had an enclosed cab for the first time and, and boy we really thought uh we were making some headway and, and progress and, and you know and we, we now here we are here. So I, I think, you know, one of the main things I always uh, appreciated listening and, and going to conferences and listen to T. Boone Pickens talk and sit around and hear some of his ideas. Uh, reflecting back, one of my big keys to success has been my ability to accept and embrace change. So I think that's really the theme. I will uh, open it up for questions if anyone has any, uh, or I can talk real quick if you guys want me to on what we're hearing uh, on the. Uh, virus from up to you guys on your end yeah, on the, questions uh, out there is this is my on my on or not you're on. yeah you're on i can hear you okay very good well 
Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, we've got a couple minutes if anybody's got some questions and wants to type some up. I, but you know, my main question out of your whole thing was uh, why the run on toilet paper? I get the paper towels now, but why, why the run on uh, toilet paper? Can you answer that one for me? Yeah, coming out of all the data and all the info coming out of China was simply that the biggest thing they had missed was, you know, that they were going to, and into Italy, my daughter's saying as well, that, that people didn't recognize that they would not be able to get their hands on toilet paper. I told my wife, I said, we're out here on the lake, we're out the lake right now. And uh, I said, I'm glad I didn't pick up any of the leaves this year, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we, my wife didn't think it was too funny either, but anyway, so. I'm with you. It's just crazy on the toilet paper front. So I guess a lot of, you know, the preppers and, and doomsdayers. And like I said, we got long some rice back a while back and stayed long rice. And that's, that's worked well. But there you go. I don't know. Definitely scary times uh, for sure. We're, we're, we're a little worried. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we're hearing the same thing. Everyone, you know, we've been on some different calls with some senators and different things of that nature. And, you know, we, we think it's going to, we think we may have to hunker down here for a while. So, I think it's going to take some time and that's, that's going to be the difficult part of this is, you know, how long can we uh, just stay hunkered down? It's all of our satellite imagery that we get back in, in the air health and, it, you know, and the heat indexes in Wuhan and out of China and everything. I mean, you're still on lockdown in Wuhan. I mean, you're still getting very limited traffic movement. I mean, nothing during the days, none on the weekend. So, you know, you're, you're, you're at least, you know, eight, 10 weeks deep into, into that. And we, you know, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how long we can keep people uh, in this type of lockdown mode. I, I don't even think people have gone into a lockdown mode yet. We're still seeing a lot of movement uh, on all of our traffic data. Now, out of Manhattan and into New York, we have seen a substantial reduction. They've reduced probably 75%, 80% on the movement. Uh, out in California, we're starting to see some reduction. But through the Midwest, I mean, people are still just, you know, kind of acting like it's not really that big of a deal. And uh, I don't know. I, I I'm telling you, it's caught, it's caught some people way, way off sides here. And, uh, you know, I, I think you got to err to the side of caution. The, the only, the, the, the issue is, I mean, it's like assessing risk on the floor. And I mean, if you're right and it is no big deal, well, who cares? You're in the same position you're in. But if you're wrong, you're horribly wrong. And so I, I see there's really no, there's really no reason uh, to not to err to the side of extreme caution through the, through the measure. I mean, there, there, there's no gain if you're right. I mean, if you're right, life goes on as we're normally going on. Like I said, if you're wrong, you're horribly wrong. So uh, I, I just think we, we, we got to take precaution. You're going to have to limit the movement. Uh, and that's what we're seeing work the best. That's in all of our early calls two weeks ago. I mean, even a week, two weeks ago, our calls were, you know, containment's out the window I mean, we, we, containment's probably off the board. I mean, now it's just care and how, how, how can you avoid crashing the, the healthcare system? And, and, you know, I, I think that's still uh, a main, main concern. We're seeing some pop-up uh, tents already start. Uh, I've got some friends, uh, there's some people that I'm on, like I said, with that uh, were big wheels that are, were high up at the DOD for a number of years and other people that were high up at uh, Boeing. And, you know, there's about seven strategic centers here across the U S where they have tents and they have the ventilators and, they're, they're rolling things out. And like we've seen, they moved the military uh, boats into some positions off the uh, East Coast and off the West Coast. And there's going to be some makeshift hospitals come up. I and mean, we're probably going to pass uh, China quickly. I mean, we'll probably be at 10,000 infected this weekend and, and moving aggressively higher. And I think, you know, like I said, I, I think it's, uh, it's going to get real and it's going to get real in a hurry. And uh, probably in our world, you know, you always try and forecast where's peak chaos. Peak chaos is when you probably start to find the bottom, and uh, I don't know. I mean, we've 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 countlessly read books and, and done history lessons as traders and but you know try to figure out where was peak chaos on the Titanic. You know, you don't know was it right before you know when they recognized that the boat's going down. You're getting in the water, or you peak chaos in the water. You know, we still we still feel we'd made the call uh, to Super Bowl. I, I had said you know you can liquidate, but and the market kept going up and we were on calls and I said, just be patient. Well, I mean, this thing, I think it's going to start to spiral and move. And, and then we, we did get that uh, reaction and people keep calling every day. And I'm talking on calls wanting to know when, when's the bottom. And I said, I, I even said during Super Bowl, I don't think the bottom happens to you have people in the Midwest walking around with masks. On. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't know if that's going to happen anytime soon. I, I, I don't see it. I mean, uh, you, I did, 
We didn't see it in Italy at all until they lost it. And now you see it everywhere. Uh, but I think, you know, like anything in life perspective, um, I don't actually know anyone personally that has it personally, personally. Um, I, like I said, it did freak us out when my daughter had to be quarantined and she was in the mix in Italy. Um, but I think it's going to take having to know some people and have to have some loved ones that are in harm's way. And then you'll probably reach peak chaos. We had heard, and I'm sure you guys have heard, I mean, I think Target and Walmart are going to allow them to set up some tents and you're going to start having some things play out uh, that, that probably shake some people up uh, on that front. And when that happens, uh, that's probably going to be the, the, the bottom in, in the market. And, you know, there's some talk that, you know, how bad's unemployment going to peak and the market will sniff out the peak in unemployment, maybe four weeks early. That's what it did in 08. Unemployment peaked at the uh, end of March 09. We bottomed in early March. So, you know, the market sniffed it out about three to four weeks early. So a lot of questioning right now in our front, in the hedge fund front, is when will unemployment peak? Like, we think it's going to happen fast and furious. It took about seven months to even get unemployment to really spike in 08. You, you really, you peaked in October of 07. Uh, you dropped off and you started to see a rise in unemployment, maybe July of 2008. And then that unemployment didn't peak until March of, like I said, late March of 09. But we think this is going to happen fast and furious. We're hearing thousands and thousands of layoffs. All of our Google data that's coming back is showing the, the searches for unemployment is really skyrocketing uh, at a faster pace than anyone had thought. And the question is, how long will some of these companies hang on to their employees? I, that's the magic question. We, we, we don't know that. We, we think it's a perfect storm because you had a really tight labor market and no one wants to let their employees go because we had a hard time getting employees. So we're going to try and keep them as long as we can. The other part of it is you got interest rates so low, there's not a lot of incentive for a banker or a bank board to make loans at three and four uh, percent when they know that the company is deep on the ropes. So it, it's going to be tough, folks. I mean, that, that's the that's the dilemma. And then, and then with the crude oil situation and how that could spill over and affect some of our ag lending banks, I, I think you just, you know, you have to be playing it. We're playing the long ball. I mean, we're 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 trying to nestle in here and just get past. Uh, we think six months, eight months. You know, we think the peak of the virus. We continue here. The peak of the virus is probably end of May, middle of April. We then we we maybe I think we get some tools to work with that we can curtail it. Everyone says be cautious jumping back in uh, right there in the summer because it might it might look like it's died down and then. And we come back a little and have maybe another little bout in the fall. That's what we're trying to avoid is that second wave. Then if you look at Spanish flu, it was a second wave that did all the damage. So we hope that we'll get all hands on deck. I think the Americans and, uh, and our sharpest and best people are going to find some solutions and we're going to get past this damn thing. We know we're going to get past it. Uh, now it just becomes a matter of time. And that's why I said I, I wouldn't get, this is a slippery slope. I wouldn't get super aggressive here anytime soon. But if you're looking to find the bottom, uh, in the market. I think that's what you have to think about is, is where's peak unemployment? How quick do they get laid off? And, and then may, and then kind of start and play that out in your head. I, I think we're going to be okay. Uh, you know, as far as the, I think you're going to have some shakeout, what we're looking for, just to let you guys know, there's going to be massive shakeout in Airbnb. Okay. It's going to blow the lid off of the Airbnb business. And we know of a lot of people that have a lot of holdings in, in some key locations around the United States, vacation places, they're going to get blown up. I mean, they're going to have their face ripped off. So we're looking to, on that break, maybe pick up some places along the ocean, uh, pick up some other places uh, that are in some good uh, spots for, for that because they're just going to be way overextended. They were all banking on these Airbnbs to come and stay at their locations. Well, they're just not going to happen. I mean, everything's getting canceled and nobody's moving anywhere. So. That's going to be a problem. We also think you're going to see some shakeout on the real estate side. I mean, you see what happened to Caldwell Banker stock and some of these other stuff. They got annihilated. And then you're having no showings in the houses right now. People are canceled. Nobody wants to buy. Nobody wants to go look at someone's house if they got in uh, Corona. So, I, I mean, there's going to be a shakeout there. And then some of these virtual, you know, this is probably where Redfin and some of these other uh, people get a hold. You know, they're going to do these virtual tours, the virtual showings. And I think that's going to smack some things around. 
I, hey, All I right, just, Kevin. Yeah, hey, I, work. Go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, I, I am bullish soybeans and corn. I did buy uh, soybeans and wheat last yesterday. Uh, we had bought, we had, like I said, we were long some rice. We just simply on that front, I think, I think the American farmer is going to have a shot here. I think this is where we're going to show and shine. I think this is getting into South America right now in the parts of Argentina and Brazil. Things are going to start heating up over there temperature wise. I don't think they're going to deliver. I don't think they're, I think they're going to have massive port problems. I think they're going to have labor problems. They're going to have all kinds of issues. Uh, and I think you're going to see that start to sprinkle into the Black Sea region. I, I think this is where American agriculture may, this may be our window, you know, uh, this this may be may be a blessing in disguise, so to speak. We'll we'll see how it plays out. But I appreciate everyone's time. I, I don't want to get you off track. Thank you very much.